Welcome and thank you for standing by. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. During the question and answer session, please press star 1 on your touchtone phone. Today's conference is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. And now, I'd like to turn the meeting over to Ms. Andrea De Silva. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Good evening, everyone, and good morning to those of you joining us early on in China. Welcome to our webinar titled, The Music Industry, Selecting Partners and Protecting Intellectual Property Rights in China. My name is Andrea De Silva. I'm a policy analyst for the media and entertainment industry here in Washington, D.C. at the International Trade Administration, which is part of the U.S. Department of Commerce. Before introducing our panel of CSER experts, I need to cover just a few housekeeping items. At the end of the webinar, we will offer the Q&A session Mary just mentioned, and the phone lines will be opened. The operators will come on to instruct you how to proceed. Uh, you'll be on mute until then, as you know, so you won't be able to ask questions until the very end. Uh, but we do welcome your input, so please stay on. We'll also email all of the presentations to the registered participants after the webinar, and we will post the webinar online at stopfakes.gov and export.gov. If you were to experience any difficulties logging on, you can call the conference registration. That number is 1-800-475-5000 and ask for technical assistance. If you're not able to log on, you can email Don Bruno at don.bruno at trade.gov, and she can send you the PowerPoint presentations if necessary. Um, so on to the program. Um, last year, after I participated at the American Association for Independent Music's Indie Week in New York City, uh, I started to work pretty closely with Rich and his team, and we've been looking for ways to provide support to your industry that would be practical and meaningful. And it really is a pleasure to work with the independent sector. You're creative, you're dynamic, and you represent a fantastic industry that converges with art, technology, intellectual property challenges. Uh, your industry is comprised mostly of small businesses, which is, which is the landscape of our economy. And you truly represent what is uniquely American abroad in a lasting manner. And you also collaborate with foreign counterparts in so many different ways to support the overall global music business. So we're excited to talk with you about China and the music industry in the hopes that you'll increase your tool set to be better equipped to export. Um, in addition, if you're interested in other topics in the future, please send your ideas over to us and we'll post our email addresses at the end of the webinar. Uh, the Chinese market holds robust potential and our speakers, Tim Smith, Deputy Head of the Dispute Resolution Team at Rouse Law Firm, also based in Beijing, will talk about the current environment for your industry with an in-depth discussion of the intellectual property regime. And by way of background, he was previously an executive at the IFPI and is an expert on the recording industry. Equally qualified, Mr. John Grabowski, partner at the law offices of Fager Baker Daniels in Shanghai, is a China expert and a leading merger and acquisition attorney and he will discuss, among other things, the fine points of partnering and cooperative joint ventures. You'll also hear from our Export Assistance Center in New York City, Dawn Bruno, and she's been my partner in setting up this webinar. Thanks, Dawn. Here in D.C., uh, Raquel Cohen will talk about what the U.S. government is doing to support your efforts to protect creative content and enforce IP rules around the world. Unfortunately, Janice Wingle will not be joining us during the question and answer session. Uh, but we hope to hear from her on future webinars. I now turn the microphone over to Rich Bangloff, our fearless leader and president of the American Association of Independent Music, who is just back from MEDEM in Cannes. Rich? Oh, thank you very much, Andrea. I'm going to be brief. Uh, this journey for A2IM started two years ago at MEDEM uh, when we were walking around. We just completed our seventh MEDEM. But we started talking to people at all the other stands from around the world, and we noted that they were all getting government assistance. Uh, actually, not all. 30 out of 32 were getting government assistance. Uh, uh, the U.S. plus one other wasn't. And I said, gee, this, this doesn't seem fair. And your board, the A2IM board, made it an initiative we should follow. <clears throat> this is compounded by the IFPI, the International Trade Organization Statistics which have shown since 2005 through 2010 
the U.S. market share of the music industry at wholesale has fallen from 34% of the world market to 26% of the market. That's an awful statistic, which we need assistance to reverse. And the way we reverse it and make a living, which is the most important thing to small businesses, as Andrea said, is by increasing our share of exports. Uh, we've gotten very lucky. Uh, as a result, we started a year and a half ago. You had a contention of about 10 of a combination of the members of uh, A2IM from around the country. We converged on Washington and started making contacts. Fortunately, one of the contacts we made was a commerce. Uh, we recently won for New York State members a step grant. Uh, the trip's been postponed, but we plan to go there later this year and visit the Asia market uh, to make inroads there. And uh, in two weeks, we'll be filing what's called an NDCP grant for all our members from all around the country to be able to participate in overseas trades missions. That's our goal. That, in a nutshell, is what we're up to as an organization, A2IM. But I really want to give a big thank you to Andrea De Silva down in D.C. and Dawn Bruno up here in New York, who work for the U.S. Commerce ITA. They've been fabulous partners for the last uh, year and a half, really guiding us, being our advocates, watching out for us. We we couldn't be where we are without them. So I'm gonna, as I turn it over to uh, Dawn, with a big thank you to Dawn and Andrea, who spoke before, we thank you all. All of us thank you, too, very, very much. Dawn? Thank you, Rich, and thank you, Andrea. I'm really um, happy to be, uh, to be working with this industry. I'm a senior international trade specialist within the U.S. Department of Commerce, and I'm located in our office in New York City. We do have offices in almost every major U.S. city and many, many smaller cities as well, and our counterparts are in the U.S. embassies and consulates overseas. And the way that we work is by industry sector. So we have specialists in the embassies uh, who work um, with, our, with our colleagues here in the United States, to help small and medium-sized businesses sell their products overseas, find new markets, find buyers, find partners, overcome challenges. And um, it's, it's, a, it's a great service to companies that don't necessarily know that, that we're out there to, to help them and be their advocate. So we really, um, I really enjoyed starting to work with, with the music industry, starting to work more with HOIM members. I will be sending follow-up information after the webinar, and I will connect all of you to your local U.S. Department of Commerce office and your local specialist. And I encourage you to start to start working closely with them um, to figure out how we can best help you and support you as you're doing international business. So with that, I am going to turn it over to Raquel Cohen. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Raquel Cohen. And I am part of the Department of Commerce. I work in the Office of Intellectual Property Rights. And I'm going to go over a couple of basic uh, resources the U.S. government provides uh, to protect and enforce your intellectual property in China. So let's get right into it. And you're going to notice I'm going to go through pretty quickly, but you can always uh, access links and information um, with uh, the webinar that's going to be provided to you later. Okay. So the attorneys later on will go into de de these three details, but basically the importance of protecting your intellectual property in China is remember IP rights differ in the U.S. and China. So remember the three R's, which is registration, recordation, and remedies, and I'll explain this a little bit more. Um, you want to protect your intellectual property in China because it affords you different uh, protections for enforcement of your IP. For example, one, awesome, one amazing program provided by the Customs and Border Patrol in the United States is once you receive a U.S. trademark registration, you can record that with Customs and Border. And if you notice you have counterfeit goods in China coming into the United States, Customs and Border Patrol will enforce your rights and stop goods at the ports. So that's a great program. I'll provide you the link later. A couple of other remedies available to you here in the United States. Um, always know that you have to enforce your intellectual property because it's a private right. So the U.S. government can only help you once you have exhausted all your legal remedies. The attorneys later on will explain your legal remedies in China. Um, you can also always file a Section 337 claim through the International Trade Commission. Uh, if you Google that, you can find out, uh, you can protect against uh, patent infringement or trade secret infringement. Um, and then, again, if there's any copyright infringement, which is probably more relevant to your business, you should log on to iprcenter.gov, 
which is uh, the National IPR Coordinating Center located here in Washington, D.C., and they'll start an immediate investigation on any infringement and coordinate with all the U.S. government agencies. So these are all great links uh, to be aware of. Another great resource, which is put out by my office here at uh, the International Trade Administration, is the website stopfakes.gov. It offers a lot of U.S. government intellectual property resources about country-specific. We have a link to some China webinars, which is uh, put on by my colleague Janice Wingo. Um, and you can actually go back and listen to old uh, webinars, and it goes over copyright enforcement, how to do things in China. So before you hire legal attorneys, you can do some research and learn about uh, your protections in China. Um, this website offers also an online IPR training module to teach you the basics of intellectual property. Um, it also offers one hour of free consultation with an attorney. There's a, there's a phone number you can call, and it's a program put on between the Department of Commerce and the ABA, which is the American Bar Association. Uh, so that's a great resource. I recommend that. Um, and it also provides you information on IPR attaches, so when you are on the ground in China, we highly recommend you contact the embassy in Beijing. Uh, we have special IPR experts, and they're well-connected in the community. So they're a great resource if you're having any troubles from the beginning of getting your intellectual property protection to enforcing it as well. Um, we also have another feature which is more uh, sophisticated, but if you have an ongoing issue uh, with enforcement in China, with your, say, copyright infringement, um, you can forward that issue to my office here in IETA, and we set up a team. And if we think it's a systemic issue or a policy issue, we can raise it through different channels within the government because we have dialogues with the Chinese government. So if this is a systemic issue and you feel you have exhausted all of your legal remedies, this is another great resource that the U.S. government can provide U.S. companies. Uh, another great website is the embassy's website, which is featured here on this link. Um, we have uh, recommendations. Yeah, one second, the slides are moving. Um, the website offers uh, information on um, local attorneys in Beijing and resources, so it's a great resource as well. Um, and then lastly, I wanted to point out a couple of intellectual property um, first line of defense or common sense. Um, you also want to make sure you vet your partners well in China, and a great resource is expert.gov. Um, U.S. Foreign Commercial Service offers a great resource where they provide you information on your business partners. Um, you also want to make sure that you're actively protecting your intellectual property, so the attorneys will go into more detail, but you want to think ahead and project a budget. So it's not just for protecting, but for enforcing your rights. Um, so that's very good to know. And then you also want to think strategically. So before you put your products out there, you put your music out there, you put any brochures out there, you want to make sure you have copyright protections on everything. Um, you also want to make sure you have the .cn or any websites you have. Um, we've seen a lot of uh, cyber squatting, and it ends up being a new trend in China where companies see a future product coming into China, and they go ahead and reserve the website, the domain name, and they try to sell it back to you. So you want to think five years ahead uh, in your business plan and project where you're going to be and make sure you, you get all those protections in line before you start doing business in China. Um, and lastly, I would recommend to make sure you have your copyrights for catalogs, for packaging, and for prom promotional material. You want to think strategically, and you want to think you're going to be there for the long haul, and it's worth the investment. And I want to thank you very much, and that was my presentation. And if you have any further questions, please go ahead and contact me. My email address is right there, raquel.cohen at trade.gov. And I specifically work with U.S. companies doing business in China. So I like to hear, you know, what's going on. And if you have any questions early on to later on in your business, uh, I'm always here for you. So thank you very much.
Hi. Um, I'd like to now turn the mic over to uh, Tim Smith. Go ahead, Tim. Thank you very much, and, and good afternoon, good evening to all of you. It's early morning here in China. Um, first of all, let me introduce myself and Rouse very briefly, just to give you some context. Um, and thank you to and Andrea and Dawn for their introductions as well. Um, Rouse is a, an intellectual property firm specializing really in emerging markets. Uh, we're a UK headquartered firm, uh, but we only do intellectual property. And uh, we've been in China for um, nearly 19 years now, starting in, in, uh, in 1993. Um, I'm a partner here in, in Rouse and, and head the Beijing office here. And my focus is on, on helping international businesses operating in China, and my specialism um, is really in IP rights uh, enforcement, acting for a variety of copyright owners in China, and also some uh, some major trademark and, and, and patent owners. Um, my own personal background, before joining Rouse in 2008, I was with the um, recording industry with IFPI for five for nearly five years. Um, my focus there was on uh, enforcing the industry's rights uh, around the world. <coughs> when I started, I was looking at some, um, some physical piracy issues, optical disc piracy, and then quickly that turned into a complete focus on, on digital piracy issues. And it was with IFPI being based in London that I got involved in China in about um, 2005-06. And, and then led proceedings run by the industry <coughs> against both Yahoo and Baidu in China. There's a long story <coughs> behind both of those, and I'll, I'll mention them a little bit later as we get into the, into the, um, into the webinar. But let me um, get into the meat of it itself. So, what I'm, there you can see the overview slide, just to run through what I'm intending to cover today. We'll start with an introduction and the big picture, have a quick look at China, just look at some of the statistics to see what it represents as a market, or at least a potential market. Um, we'll then look as an overview of, the, uh, of how you access that market, the, really the regulatory picture. Um, some of those points in the regulatory picture, I know John Grabowski is going to go into in further detail following me, but I'll try and give an overview of the, of the, um, of the issues there. I'll, I'll put up some statistics about the legitimate music market. Um, so, given that regulatory picture of accessing the market, we can see what the legitimate market looks like. We can also, I'll then have a look at how piracy plays into it here and what threats uh, piracy offers to the legitimate market. I'm then going to uh, touch on music and copyright, the rights that uh, labels enjoy in China those rights uh, and how those rights can be used to take action against piracy and also what they represent in terms of opportunities to derive revenue. Uh, I'll take a quick look at enforcement just to give you an overview of the kind of actions that are available in China and I'll also look at some of the, uh, just give you an overview of some of the actions that have been taken, um, some on an individual label basis, others on, a, on an industry basis to demonstrate that those rights um, uh, are enforceable. And finally, I'll look at some of the events from 2011 and, and some of the things going on in 2012 and, and maybe take a view as to how the market might look going forward. So, it's a big picture. Always start with the, with the big numbers because it's always significant when talking about China. We've got an enormous population, 1.37 billion at last count. Very recently, the Chinese population turned from being uh, predominantly rural to a predominantly urban population um, and that demonstrates that there is a, a growing middle class here with a growing amount of disposable income. Median age of 35 is higher than in other developing jurisdictions and really that's uh, an indication of, of how the one-child policy has been, has been operating. Obviously the principal language is Mandarin but there's many other dialects spent, uh, spoken all over the, all over the country. And the GDP per capita, I think this is last year's figure, um, the growth of this figure in the last 30 years has been absolutely staggering um, from a baseline of only a few hundred dollars um, in the early 80s. That growth has been absolutely extraordinary. And if you've ever spent time in any of the major cities in China, 
whether that be Beijing, Shanghai, Guangzhou, or Shenzhen, you'll see you know, extraordinary amounts of, um, of wealth focused sometimes in, in just a few people, but also see disposable income. So let's look a little, little more at what this, um, what this market could be. It's a massive potential market, um, an internet population of 513 million at last count, over half a billion have access to the internet, that's twice the size of the US. Um, it's grown, grew 12% last year, that's um, over 120 million more than there were at the end of 2009. Uh, the, the, the rate of growth has actually slowed down in, um, I recall looking at this in 2007-8, when there were a quarter of a million people joining the internet each day in China. That slowed down a little bit. We now just have 150,000 joining each day, more than a million each week. But you can see this is still growing. And of those, the majority of those do have access to broadband at home. Uh, many others are accessing broadband through internet cafes or through their, through their workplace. And the internet penetration in China, you can see it's 38%. That, um, that broke through the global average in 2008, demonstrating China's kind of emergence in, towards a developed country, in, at least in internet terms. Um, but there's obviously still a, a long way to go in terms of uh, internet penetration and a lot more um, users to come online. So, with all of those internet users, let's have a let's take a quick look at the use of music online. These figures come from, the, um, from one, of the, uh, one of the national providers of, of statistics, CNNIC, uh, which issues an annual report on, on use on the Internet. So these are, these are quite robust figures, and I've been tracing them over the past few years. Um, music is extremely popular online in China. 75% of all users accessing music online, so that's 380-odd million online music users. Um, as we'll see, that doesn't represent a, 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 a significant legitimate market yet, but there clearly is the interest and there clearly is the use. I've got a few other figures down there just to show the other popular activities. IM, search engines, perhaps not surprisingly, um, more popular. But it's, music is even more popular, we can see, than, than news and video. Uh, in terms of what people are listening to, there is some Chinese, mainland Chinese repertoire, but... Um, a lot of the music listened to uh, is what you might call canto pop. So there's a lot of music coming out of uh, Hong Kong and Taiwan, also from Korea and, uh, and Japan, coming from around the region. Some of that music is is, re is recorded in the local language and then re-recorded in Mandarin, specifically for the Chinese market. Some of it isn't, but it still remains still remains popular in the market here. That's a, a brief look at the online picture. Now let's have a quick look at the, uh, at the mobile picture, which is where these figures are you know, even more staggering. We have just shy of a billion mobile phone subscribers in China. Again, these figures blow anything else out of the water around the world. Um, and nearly 400 million of those can access the internet by mobile. That's not all smartphones. The smartphone market is really just exploding now. We can China's just become the largest smartphone market in the world, overtaking the U.S. with their 24 million smartphone handsets shipped in the last quarter of 2011, in Q quarter three of 2011 alone. So there's a growing um, access to the internet through mobiles, and as we'll see, that represents an important piece um, in, the, uh, in, in the legitimate market and the potential market going forward. That's given us a, a brief overview of the market. Let's then look at some of these, um, these regulatory issues that, that are present in accessing the market. Clearly, it's a, um, as we'll see, it's a highly regulated market. Um, the key concerns of the Chinese government are, uh, one, straight censorship, but also more just a general control uh, of the media and of the messaging that, that, that reaches the public here. Um, what, we'll, what I'll run through, are, are just, just give you an idea of how the regulatory environment works uh, for signing and recording, for import, for manufacture, publication and distribution. They're all uh, separate activities from a regulatory point of view and, uh, and there are 
different um, requirements for each piece. And then there is also censorship. Uh, and as I've mentioned, uh, John Grabowski will be um, going through some of that in more detail after me. Um, the market itself is regulated principally by two, in, in, two ministries. That's MIIT, the Ministry of Information and Industry and Information Technology, and GAPP, the General Administration of Press and Publications. On the censorship side, I haven't got it down there, but the Ministry of Culture um, also plays a, a, a significant role. Um, I'll also make a comment here that the, how the different ministries uh, interrelate is in itself a pretty complex picture. Um, there are currently and have been some time effectively turf wars going on between the ministries here, which means we see an overlap in regulation in places or a lack of clarity in certain areas. Um, <clears throat> and we do see that as a good example of, of the censorship picture at the moment, where both GAPP and the Ministry of Culture are involved. But I'll come on to that in a moment. So moving first to the, uh, to the first of those, signing and recording. Um, in short, only wholly, owned, wholly Chinese owned companies can sign and record artists in China. Uh, the position for Hong Kong companies is a little bit more relaxed because of the bilateral arrangements between the mainland and Hong Kong. Hong Kong companies can record, but it's not actually clear whether they can, whether they can sign them exclusively. Um, signing Chinese artists may not yet be uh, an interest or a concern for A2IM members, um, but because of the favorable arrangements with Hong Kong, we do see that many labels choose to access the Chinese market uh, from Hong Kong. And that's certainly how um, many of the majors have, have, um, have approached the market. So assuming we're not, um, we're not recording in China, then obviously there's a need to bring the music uh, to China. And the first of, these, uh, the first of the regulatory issues we need to look at is, is importation. Import applies to both finished physical product or, or masters brought in for, for manufacture and distribution here. Um, there have been some changes recently, and we'll see there have been some changes recently, not only in importation, but also in distribution. These changes have all come about as a result of uh, what was a long-running uh, WTO complaint by the U.S., led by the U.S., supported by others. Uh, which succeeded in, in opening the market to some extent in various areas. The, um, and the deadline for implementation by the Chinese government to some of those changes was, was 2011, which is why we've seen some changes there. So until 2011, um, importation could only be done by uh, the, the state-owned entity, the SOE, that was given the monopoly on music import. There was a need to engage with that that importer and that importer only. Now, in theory, foreign invested companies can apply for an import license, but these are, are new regulations, and it's a it's a not a well trodden area, and it's largely unknown. If if it's going to be a question of recording, uh, bringing masters in for for manufacture and um, and distribution internally, then the manufacturer must also take place by a wholly owned Chinese company. That is a brief look at importation. We then have the, the separate issue of, of publication. This is, this is one of the key ways in which um, uh, GAPP, uh, the General Administration of Press and Publications, exercises its regulatory control over the market. Um, publication is different from distribution, and I'll come on to look at distribution briefly, both uh, physical and digital. <coughs> but we can see that uh, um, publication is a necessary step, and there are a few publication houses uh, which need to be used, but they are all state-owned enterprises. Uh, all of those uh, publication houses are regulated by GAPP, and essentially a submission needs to be made to the to the publication house, along with various supporting documentation. Um, 
and the two, perhaps the two key things there are a certificate of auth authentication. This is a document which essentially demonstrates that you do own the rights in the sound recording that you're seeking to, um, to publish in China. Uh, that can be issued by uh, the IFPI for IFPI members. And if uh, you're not an IFPI member, then the Copyright Protection Center at the, the, Nas the National um, Copyright Administration of China, the NCAC, uh, can issue those certificates for authentication. Also, there's a need for an ISRC code. Um, there's been a little relaxation there. Previously, the um, only ISRC codes issued by the Copyright Protection Center at the NCAC were recognized. Now, um, ISRC codes issued overseas are being recognized, so that's a, that's a slight relaxation. As publication, then we come to, to distribution. Um, at first, I'm going to have a look at physical distribution. The physical distribution uh, position has been, was opened up a, a little while ago in 2007. Um, between 2007 and, and 2011, there was a requirement that, uh, that, that, that the um, Chinese entity involved in the distribution, uh, that a, sorry, that a Chinese entity should hold the majority of shares in the company during the distribution. Um, now, following the changes in 2011, there still is a need for it to be done in cooperation with a Chinese partner, but the the foreign company can now be a majority shareholder of the distributor. And again, uh, indicating the more relaxed approach to, or, or the better access that Hong Kong companies have, Hong Kong companies can now be 100% owners of Chinese distributors. I'll come on to the censorship picture uh, later, but um, in practice for physical distribution, it's, it's typically the label itself that applies for the censorship, censorship clearance. That's a... Uh, snapshot of uh, physical distribution. Online is a, is a, is a different picture and uh, in some ways more regulated. If you want to sell or distribute music online, then you need to have a, a permit from the Ministry of Culture and to be, to be licensed to be a cultural products network service provider. Um, before the, the changes uh, that had to be any cultural products network service provider had to be a wholly Chinese owned entity. There's been, been a relaxation in that and John will give us some of the details later. And to be a, there's, there's an interesting, interesting issue here, to, to be a seller online, uh, strictly you need to be an exclusive licensee. Um, now, that would suggest that if, uh, if an exclusive license has been granted to one online distributor, then there should only be one. And strictly that's the case. Uh, but what we find in practice is that the requirement that a seller be an exclusive license is not strictly enforced. So this is a, a classic situation where the law says one thing, um, practice is different from that, and there, there, there's no sort of no active agreement from the state, but there's no active enforcement of the issues, meaning that in practice, labels do have more than one licensee, and that's either granting uh, multiple licensee, licenses, but on the understanding that they're not actually exclusive, but they are on the face of them exclusive, uh, should the authorities be look, wanting to look at those, or sometimes an exclusive license is granted and then, and then sub-licenses are are granted as directed by the label. So there are ways around um, the exclusive license requirement. And in, uh, in practice, in the online distribution space, it is the exclusive licensee that normally applies for, uh, for uh, censorship clearance. So let's look at what uh, censorship clearance looks like. Uh, in China, it's sometimes known as content review, which sounds a little more benign in its, in its title. Um, and this is an area where, as I mentioned, there have been turf wars ongoing between the GAPP and the Ministry of Culture. 
in simple terms, the um, GAPP is responsible for clearing physical product, and the Ministry of Culture is responsible for clearing digital product. But um, things aren't don't work out quite so cleanly, or and we'll see there's actually challenges because that presents for, for double clearance in some situations. For physical product, so the, it's the, usually the label that applies, and that application must be to GAPP, and the things that must be provided, amongst others, uh, to, with the application form are a sample of the product, the lyrics in Chinese, and uh, the other, other textual materials that, that come with the, the finished product, and the import agreement that was um, uh, in place to allow the product to be imported in the first place. Um, the, having, having cleared music for censorship of, uh, uh, and clearing it for the physical product, in practice, the Ministry of Culture should recognize the, the clearances issued by the uh, GAPP for uh, when considering online content. But in practice, they don't. It's not automatic, and that can lead to a delay, which means that there are where product is going to be released physically and digitally, often the case. Um, then there is a need to go through two censorship um, uh, clearance procedures, which just slows down, slows down access to the market. Confusingly as well, there have been released provisions for GAPP to clear online content, um, but there's no specific regulations there yet, so it's not accessible yet, and it's not clear how that would work and how that would relate to the, to the Ministry of Culture provisions on online content. So, moving then to the, to the uh, online content picture. As I said, the Ministry of, content, Ministry of um, Culture is responsible. And in this situation, it's usually the, uh, the online distributor, the exclusive licensee that is applying for this. There are similar similar requirements uh, that need to go through the application. That's uh, the original text lyrics and, uh, and a translation of them, evidence of the copyright ownership, and then this permission for uh, the operation as a cultural products network service provider for the, for the party that's actually going to be distributing these products uh, within China. That, um, that application process with the Ministry of Culture can be done online and can take up to 15 days. There is, they say, a green channel for very urgent applications. For instance, if you've got a worldwide simultaneous release and you want it to be hitting the ground in China just when it is in, in other countries, that uh, is available. How widely available is not clear, but they, they claim that it can be done in, in, in as little as uh, two or three days. Um, these, these challenges, the lack of clarity between um, GAPP and the Ministry of Culture are the subject of lobbying by the industry. Um, I was present recently at the uh, European-China IP dialogue where these issues were raised. Um, and you know, the challenge is not to uh, censorship per se. That's a, a much more difficult and a much greater hot potato politically. The challenges are to the lack of um, come from the lack of clarity, this double clearance that, that you need for physical and digital product, the lack of recognition or lack of automatic recognition by one ministry from clearance by the other, and this speed. And all of that, uh, all of those things represent uh, barriers to entry, and they provide, if there's going to be a delay of two weeks or more, they provide the opportunity for the illegitimate market to, to take hold in what may be you know, key time for for um, the sale or distribution of, of legitimate product. So that's a, a quick overview of the, of the regulatory hurdles. Let's um, look at then what the legitimate market looks like given those regulatory hurdles in place. As I mentioned, China has for twice as many internet users the, as, as users as the US, but digital revenues here are about 1% of that in the US. Um, we can see, just looking at those figures there, there's a, uh, um, not a terribly rosy picture. The total market in 2010 uh, was just $64 million. 
which makes it a, a smaller market than Ireland, for example. Uh, and we can see that there's actually been a decline from 2009 to 2010 and also a decline from uh, 2008 to 2009. So that, that has been the trend currently. That, um, perhaps not surprisingly, we are, we are seeing a decline in the sale of uh, physical units. Um, and, and also, a little more worryingly, we're seeing a decline in, in, the, um, in the digital revenues as well. Digital represents, as you can see there, the, the majority of the sales these days. Um, that is, on the one hand, it's positive because there are that that looks set to grow. On the other hand, because of the uh, declining physical market, those figures are somewhat flattered. We can see, in terms of the, the physical units sold, we just had uh, 4.1 million units sold in the whole of China in 2010 which is absolutely tiny. And uh, just speaking from my own personal experience as, as a resident of Beijing, and I'm sure John would say the same in relation to Shanghai, finding legitimate physical product is actually very difficult. Um, finding illegitimate physical product is very easy. Um, and you're offered it on the street quite regularly, or there are CD and DVD stores which, um, which happily, quite happily offer illegitimate content uh, on the shelf. So, as I mentioned, digital represents the, uh, the rosier picture, so let's have a look at how that, uh, the digital market breaks down. Um, we can see, and we can see quite quickly by looking at those, those formats that are, um, that, that ring, ring back tones is the, presents the largest proportion of the digital income that the, the mobile market uh, here is is clearly important, and for issues such as mobile mobile single track downloads and ringback tones, those are areas where piracy is is much less of an issue because you've got the, the content being provided by by the telco. Um, just to give you an idea of of um, of what these uh, what these how, how much music the legitimate music does cost in China. Um, a ringback tone typically is about uh, two or three yuan, which is about 30 or 40 cents to, to purchase a ringback tone, or you can subscribe for about 75 cents a month to, to, have, uh, to, to be able to change your ringback tone from your provider. Uh, and you have about three minutes left for your presentation. Thank you. Okay. Um, and for, for mobile for mobile tracks, that's about two yuan just or, or thirty cents. So there is some revenue there, but you also see there's a lot of advertising supported, uh, which is free to the end user uh, use as well. And those legitimate services, just running through them very quickly, we can see and the major telcos are there. Baidu and Google are uh, now offering ad supported, free to end user music. We've also got um, some of the UGC sites and, and the social networking sites. That's the legitimate market. The pirate market, however, is, is massive. Estimated that 99% of, of, um, of the content in China is, is pirate, coming from a wide variety of services. Uh, perhaps tip, not typical of other markets, it's not dominated by P2P. Traditionally, it's been dominated by linking services, but also uh, that is declining to some extent, and we're seeing cyber lockers and straight download sites. The industry has taken action. Uh, but the problem uh, is deep. So that's a, unfortunately a fairly bleak picture. Let's take a quick look then at the rights that um, labels enjoy. China basically has a, uh, essentially has a modern copyright law. It's a signatory to all of the major international agreements and it has, includes rights of reproduction, distribution, rental and a network dissemination right, like an online right for, <coughs> for sound recordings. The key, the key issue in terms of revenue, however, is that there's no public performance right or broadcast right for sound recordings in China, and so there's no revenue there. Um, there are internet regulations which provide um, safe harbors, uh, similar to the DMCA. This is really China's DMCA, and it also provides for a, a takedown regime. Uh, the notice requirements of a, of a takedown are a little onerous, 
but in practice, many providers don't require, um, are reasonably flexible, and, and takedown is is a viable is a viable option here when when content is found. It's just that the challenge really comes from from the volume of music available. Um, just running through this quite quickly because I'm conscious of the time. So the the enforcement options in China, as I've mentioned, notice and takedown is available there. There are also civil, criminal, and administrative options. Civil, I'm talking about um, obviously civil proceedings through the courts, claiming copyright infringement. Uh, criminal and administrative are both obviously state-provided enforcement, um, but they're not available for, for complex issues such as indir indirect liability. Uh, criminal is available and is used in certain situations, but uh, it is subject to thresholds, so it has to be a, a major issue before the police will get interested, and you may need to have a political hook to make them more interested. Administrative enforcement is possible, but it's not uh, particularly well resourced. Uh, we've, we, it, running from 2010 into 2011, there was a special campaign which did, um, which did uh, bring down quite a lot of um, uh, illegitimate music. Um, but we've seen that drop off a little since the end of that special campaign. The industry, most of this action coming from um, IFPI, although some from private labels, um, has taken action and has had some success, both in, in finding that linking services are infringing, that Yahoo China, that's the case I was involved with, also demonstrating that peer-to-peer -peer services are liable, and obviously the straight download services, not, not that they're liable, the major, major point there is that, that there have been successful criminal actions against straight download services where the police have been able to find the servers offering the music. So there are, there are remedies available. Um, looking forward, so two of the major developments that, that occurred in 2011 uh, were the, the deadline for these, these changes required as a result of the WTO decision coming into force, which have led to the opening up to some extent of the importation and distribution. And the other major piece is um, the Baidu settlement with, with three majors. So Baidu now has license agreements with all, all four majors. And the significance of that is the Baidu closing its linking service. Uh, when taking proceedings against Baidu, we did some analysis of, of, uh, and some market survey as to how much Baidu was used as the major source of, of music in China. Baidu is the, is the Google of China. And there were literally billions of downloads going through Baidu each year. For that, linking service to have been closed is a major step forward. Um, they are now setting up a service called Ting, which is free to the end user, but advertising supported. So revenues may not be great, but at least we have one of the major services offering uh, illegitimate content now moving into a, into a revenue generating space. And in 2012 itself, we have um, the copyright law has come, uh, is now under a process of review and amendment. It's the first full review of the copyright law in more than a decade. Everything is on the table. And key issues from the uh, recording industry's point of view on the table include uh, a continuing push for the inclusion of public performance of broadcasting rights. Um, and a clarification of these intermediary liabilities, so these, these websites that are offering access to music, even if not access, offering the content themselves. That process is, is running through uh, this year, and we may expect to see a final draft by the end of the year. So that's a, a pretty quick run through, um, just to try and summarize some of those points. There are major challenges. Uh, the regulatory environment is, is challenging. Uh, it is opening up a little, but it still remains difficult. Piracy is obviously a uh, significant problem, but again, we have seen the green shoots of that moving towards a more revenue-generating picture. Obviously, the potential of the market remains massive. The interest in music is here. The access to it is here. It's just not uh, revenue-generating currently. And if we look at other markets, around the region, we see that there are 
if the state is, becomes more greatly involved, there is the potential for much, much stronger, uh, more valuable revenue. And take a market like Korea, for instance, which is a, which is a very strong picture, particularly digitally for the, for the industry. So there are some green shoots there. That's a, that's a very quick run through. There's quite a lot of detail there. I believe uh, John's going to run us through some more of the detail, but happy to take questions afterwards. Thank you, Tim, for a very comprehensive presentation. I bet there's going to be a lot of questions, and hopefully once uh, HYM uh, reschedules their trade mission to your part of the world, we'll be able to set up some meetings one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. So uh, thank you very much. And uh, now I'm going to open the mic to John Grabowski. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Pleasure to be with you uh, this morning or this evening in, in U.S. time. Uh, I am a partner with the law firm Fagre Baker Daniels. Uh, Fagre Baker Daniels is a, um, a recent combination of two firms, uh, Fagre and Benson, headquartered in Minneapolis, and uh, Baker and Daniels, headquartered in uh, Indianapolis. Uh, I have been um, working in China as a lawyer since 1991. Um, not quite continuously. I was in uh, Hong Kong for a period of about seven years uh, in the middle of this stint. But uh, today, uh, I am a, a corporate and commercial lawyer, and uh, as was indicated at the top of this presentation, um, I advise a lot of clients on uh, things like uh, mergers and acquisitions in China and uh, setting up uh, business uh, businesses in China that kind of thing. So today I'm going to be talking about uh, foreign investment in the music industry in China. Uh, and Tim already gave a very good uh, introduction to uh, some of the aspects of this. Uh, I'll be going into a few more details <coughs> with respect to a number of things. Um, as is the case with many, many things in China, uh, the music industry in China is subject to a lot of regulatory controls. And uh, this is especially the case uh, when we talk about foreign participation uh, through investment uh, in the music industry here. So here I'm going to be talking mostly about the possibility of foreign firms um, establishing an entity in China to import foreign music in, into China and then uh, distribute it within China. And uh, I'm going to be focusing mostly on uh, physical products. If we do have time, then... I'll get into some of the issues with online and, and digital. Um, as Tim indicated, there have been some recent changes that have uh, come into play because of uh, WTO. Uh, basically, what we have seen is uh, at the end of 2011, China came up with a new um, version of the foreign investment catalog. Uh, this is a uh, publication that is somewhat unique to China. Uh, what China basically does is it tries to list the industries uh, with uh, certain kinds of investments uh, into China are either encouraged, restricted, or prohibited, uh, and then basically everything else is permitted, uh, but uh, in, in each case uh, subject to, uh, to approvals. Um, and uh, in the case of uh, the foreign investment catalog, um, before these changes that came in at the end of 2011, uh, foreign firms were previously prohibited from investing in any businesses in China for the import of foreign music into China. So this meant that effectively this could only be done by Chinese-owned uh, companies. Um, similarly, uh, before these changes came into play, uh, foreign firms, if they wanted to engage in distribution of foreign music that was already imported into China, they could only do so by entering into a cooperative joint venture with one or more Chinese parties, which would hold the majority interest uh, in the joint venture. So in other words, they would only be a minority party uh, in the joint venture. As is the case with uh, many things in China, um, this rule was subject to a number of exceptions. Uh, for example, in the case of firms based in uh, Hong Kong and Macau, uh, they were largely accepted from this requirement if they met certain conditions and allowed to enter into uh, equity joint ventures where they had majority control or even wholly foreign-owned enterprises, uh, which are effectively um, subsidiaries uh, of foreign companies. 
Um, the um, uh, in terms of uh, what uh, what sort of animal the, the cooperative joint ventures were, uh, these days in China, typically cooperative joint ventures uh, are corporate in, in nature, so that means that uh, they, um, uh, they, they basically are companies. They have uh, registered capital, which is an amount of capital which is uh, contributed to the, the company when it is first set up, and uh, basically that capital cannot be freely withdrawn uh, from the company. And so in this case, you'd have a, um, a partnership really between a, a foreign company, Chinese company, uh, and, and as indicated before, under the previous requirements for distribution, the Chinese company with majority control. Now, with these changes in the catalog, um, it should be possible now for foreign firms to form cooperative joint ventures with Chinese parties and even have the and the foreign firms even having the majority uh, interest uh, in in the joint ventures uh, for both the import and the distribution of foreign music. Um, so in other words, both import and distribution have been uh, opened up uh, a fair amount, uh, at least in terms of what we see in the catalog uh, from the previous version of the catalog. However, uh, one thing to note here is that the uh, the catalog itself is not a regulation. It doesn't have the, the force of law. Uh, it's really uh, more akin to a policy document. And so what that means is that until um, the existing regulations are, are in fact, uh, amended, then uh, the rules have really not changed yet, despite the changes in the catalog. So we are expecting that the regulations will be changed soon, but that still hasn't happened yet. Uh, but uh, when the regulations are changed, then it should be possible to have uh, joint ventures where, where foreign parties do have majority interest and engage in both the importation and distribution of, uh, of music. Um, the, um, there are a number of requirements which apply to the establishment of uh, of uh, foreign music uh, distribution joint ventures in, in China. And again, I'm talking about the, the current regulations, which have not been amended yet. And um, there are, of course, some differences depending on uh, what part of China uh, CJV is established in. Uh, as is the case with uh, the establishment of all companies in China, there are a number of uh, procedural requirements. For example, you've got to come up with a feasibility study uh, since this is a joint venture, you need a joint venture contract. You need articles of association for the company. Uh, probably you're going to have uh, license agreements and, and other kinds of agreements between the parties to the joint venture. So there really will be a um, kind of a package of, of documents which need to be negotiated and concluded uh, between a foreign party and the Chinese party. Uh, as is the case with all foreign investment in, in China, um, the establishment of such a joint venture is subject to approvals in China, to governmental approvals. And uh, in the case of uh, this particular kind of, of joint venture, one that engages in, in music distribution and hopefully in the future music importation, uh, the approval requirements are, are more complicated than uh, would be the case typically with many kinds of, of joint ventures. There are a couple of extra uh, layers of approval which are required. Uh, for example, at the very beginning of the, the process, uh, normally one would need to get an initial approval from the provincial level press and publication bureau, which is under the general administration of press and publications, to establish the, the, the joint venture. So you need an initial green light just to be able to go forward and, uh, and, and, and proceed with the establishment of a joint venture. And then once you get that green light, then you've got to uh, negotiate the various joint venture documents, which we talked about before. And, um, and typically those might be submitted to a provincial level uh, commercial of, of commerce. If it is a larger joint venture with uh, total investment over $50 million U.S., uh, then in fact uh, would need to be submitted for approval to the Ministry of Commerce in Beijing. Uh, after that approval is required, then again, uh, one needs to go back to the, in most cases, the provincial level press and publication bureau 
uh, for an audiovisual product operation permit. Uh, this permit would be in addition to the normal business license that all companies in China have, and uh, would be necessary to engage in uh, would be necessary to have this to engage in distribution of music in, in China. And then uh, finally, there would need to be registration with the local administrative bureau for industry and uh, and commerce. Uh, it probably should be noted that uh, again, if we're talking about physical products, if you um, are setting up uh, retail operations, then additional requirements will come into play. Uh, for example, if you're setting up a, um, a chain store operation, a franchise uh, type operation where you've got uh, stores using a common name, um, then if uh, they're going to be established in a single province, then there would be a minimum registered capital requirement of uh, 1 million RMB uh, for such a joint venture. And uh, if, in fact, you're going to be establishing such stores in more than one province in China, uh, then the minimum requirement would be 5 million RMB instead of 1 million RMB. Otherwise, there's no particular requirement, uh, at least in the regulations, for registered capital uh, of the joint venture. However, it should be noted that um, approval authorities have pretty wide discretion to decide what they consider to be acceptable or not acceptable in terms of uh, levels of registered capital. Uh, typically, what they they do at some point is they take a look at the feasibility study for the establishment of the company, and they get a sense as to how the company is going to be capitalized, what level of business it's going to engage in, and uh, it will basically uh, kind of make its its own seat of the pants determination about whether or not it considers the capitalization to be adequate or or not. And if the cap if the capitalization is going to be too low, then typically the the approval will not be forthcoming. Um, the, um, I think it's just important to note once again that, that uh, although the foreign investment catalog has changed, the existing regulations have not yet changed, uh, and so we still have the, uh, the old rules in effect uh, as of today, but hopefully uh, those regulations will be changed quite soon. Uh, Tim already mentioned, uh, I thought it did, really did an excellent job of talking about the uh, specific approvals that are required for individual items of uh, music um, from the General Administration of Press and Publications and, and also from the, the Ministry of Culture. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, really those requirements are likely to remain in, in effect for a considerable period of time to, to come. Uh, China is still quite cautious about the kinds of uh, music and, and films and other things of this sort that uh, it allows to come into China and, and be sold to, uh, to, to mass uh, audiences here. Um, and I think that uh, finally maybe one other thing to note is that there are some regulations uh, on the books which basically require that uh, where items of foreign music have been legally imported into China, and again this would be by Chinese companies previously, uh, and then uh, published in China by one or more Chinese publishers pursuant to agreement. Uh, there is actually uh, at least one regulation that requires that uh, where this is done, then you cannot have a separate channel where the same foreign music is imported and then sold uh, for some period of at least three years. Um, so uh, I shall stop there, and I think that Tim and I would be happy to field questions. Thank you very much, John. This is very interesting, and the the approval chain seems uh, quite complex and almost a little bit like a moving target. Uh, so I'm going to open the floor for uh, question and answer, and if um, the audience can can tell us who their questions are for, um, whether it's targeted to uh, Raquel, Tim, John, or maybe Rich, that would be helpful. Um, we were scheduled to to uh, close our session in about seven minutes. However, I've been informed that we can stay open as long as we have questions and time permitting for our speakers who uh, who have to get back to the office. Uh, so, with that, uh, I'll open the floor. Just one comment before we do it, Andrea. Just want to remind everyone: you will get copies of these slides. 
And uh, Cheryl Cohn here at the HOIM office, if, as a result of looking at the slides or you think about things overnight, will gather questions from our members, which we'll send along to Andrea and Dawn. And uh, so this won't be your only chance to uh, ask questions. Thank you. We will now begin the question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question, please press star 1. Please unmute your phone and record your name clearly when prompted. Your name is required to introduce your question. If you would try your request, you may press star 2. It will be one moment for our first question, please. We do have a question from Patrick Raines, so your line is open. Uh, hi, my name is Patrick Raines. My question is probably for Tim uh, and John, or you know, either individually or together. Uh, I'm a small independent label. I'm not in a position to be thinking about doing a joint venture investment in China, but I would be very interested in finding distribution um, to get my product in the marketplace. You, you spent a lot of time talking about the joint venture process and what sounded like a much bigger venture deal, which is great, but for those of us who are uh, simply looking at trying to find a licensing partner, distribution partner, can you tell us a little bit about that? Um, I, Patrick, this is this is Tim Smith. Are you interested in uh, physical or digital, or both? Well, both, of course. Um, in terms of um, physical, I, I'm not I'm not very familiar, and I'm not an expert. I'll, I'll declare my hand now. I'm not an expert on 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 the on the commercial scene, uh, and so I'm not familiar with uh, how many of the labels uh, set them up, set, set themselves up. But um, I would, as I say, the, the, the way that many labels have come to access China is through Hong Kong because of the favorable arrangements that exist uh, in relation to Hong Kong. Um, for, for physical product, I would certainly have thought that um, trying to um, understand how, how Hong Kong uh, labels access the Chinese market for physical products and what distribution arrangements they have would be a very good starting point in, in trying to find a partner, because they will have experience in how it's done, um, and and th th because it's a fairly established channel, um, the, the, there could be a, um, some say, some good experience there. On the digital side, I don't know whether there are um, aggregators that are available to to contact who then on sell to the likes of <coughs> Baidu. Um, obviously, the regulatory, I know that, that that exists in other in other more developed jurisdictions where you have somebody who will aggregate content and then, as it were, sell it or license it on to online providers. <clears throat> because of the more stringent regulatory environment here, I, I'm afraid I simply don't know whether whether those kind of aggregators uh, exist. Um, although approaches could be made directly to to um, to some of these major players. To just just to ask how how they would go about um, uh, taking a license of your content, and obviously because particularly in the online space where it's more typical for the the online provider to be really quite engaged because they need to have this permit to operate in the first place, and because it's typically them that applies for censorship, they will have quite a lot of experience of of the market and navigating the market themselves. Um, so on the digital side, it may well be possible to to approach some of the major providers directly. Yeah, we've, Pat, uh, yeah. Bangwa, we've gathered in anticipation of the trip that you will be on uh, over a dozen uh, licensee and uh, li licensor, excuse me, uh, licensee um, uh, candidates from your fellow A2IM members, some of the ones that are larger that are doing business there. Uh, some of the ones actually they're smaller than doing business there as well. Mm -hmm. So, so we have a list of those as well as people in the touring area, sync licensing, and a variety of other okay. areas, which we'll share. Probably we're going to share with Tim and John as well. Uh, we're, we're going to we're putting lists together in anticipation of our uh, trade mission later this year, and uh, we'll share that with everyone on this call. 
Thank you. I'm just going to just going to add that um, you know I think that uh, one of the things you probably need to think about at some point is spending some time in China. It sounds like you're about to to do that uh, in the coming months. Uh, and I think there are a lot of resources that can be used here. For example, um, we it was mentioned earlier on um, the the U.S. Foreign Commercial Service does have people in China, it's got boots boots on the ground at the embassy in Beijing and the consulates in China. Uh, and uh, those commercial officers are actually quite helpful in uh, helping to find business partners in China, uh, not necessarily for setting up a company in China, but distributors if you simply want to uh, have your product distributed within China and have uh, somebody else import it. So that's one possibility. There are also um, quite a few uh, companies in China in some cases, foreign-owned companies which uh, do consulting-type type work, and uh, some of them specialize very much, you know, just exactly in uh, trying to find good business partners for uh, various opportunities that people are looking for. So, um, you know, I would uh, suggest that you consider those resources. Okay. Thank you. And our next question comes from Deborah Newman. Your line is open. Okay, great. Thank you very much. This is Deborah Newman. I'm in New York. Um, I have, I'm a consultant in the digital music space, and I have some experience uh, from now, what is almost five years ago, dealing with um, helping a San Francisco-based company that was uh, building a music service in China. They had acquired, uh, I guess, uh, called an SP in Beijing, and I was working with them and with also their law firm, uh, in, partly in that agreement, and also they had done a partnership agreement with Top 100. And I spent quite a bit of time trying to understand the rights issues involved in digital distribution and discussions with all the major label people and also with some of the music publishers. For example, EMI Music Publishing has a, an aggressive office in Beijing and trying to understand the copyright implications on the publishing side, not just on the um, uh, sound recording side. And... <clears throat> got very uh, conflicting answers from people as to whether or not we needed to worry or about, um, depending on who we were talking to, that right or not, and then trying to understand the MCSC and what it actually does and who, if anybody, collects for the underlying composition, the rights in the song as opposed to the recording. Can you explain that, uh, I guess, um, uh, Tim, because you went through these explanations of the reproduction, distribution, and rental rights, um, you know, no public performance rights for broadcast, for sound recordings, but you never, there really was no um, discussion of whether or not there is a right in the music publishing side for, let's say, digital uh, performance or distribution. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Deborah. Thank you for the question. Um, <clears throat> there is... There are um, those rights for for the authorial works, for the music, for the lyrics, uh, etc., for the publisher's rights. And it is the MCSC, the Music Copyright Society of China, that uh, collects um, collects on behalf of those rights. It's a monopoly organization set up by the state, uh, and it collects from, uh, in particular, like karaoke, um, as well as as well as well as other sources. On the uh, sound recording side, there has been, there is set up the CAVCA, which is the China Audiovisual Collections Association, I think, um, which um, is placed to collect on behalf of sound recording owners. The lack of rights for sound recording owners means that there's very little to collect. In principle, I understand that, there, that it is possible to collect from karaoke use so obviously, that's only going to be when original sound recordings are used in karaoke rather than rather than kind of re-record. Um, and my, I have a little bit of uh, background knowledge that I know that the the, the majors uh, don't like and have trouble getting on with CAVCA and have not had a great experience in there. So there's actually no no revenues that I, I understand no revenues that have been collected from any possible karaoke collection on the sound recording side. Um, so that's a broad picture. As to the practicalities of dealing with uh, 
the MCSC on the publishing side, I'm afraid I, I don't have any personal experience, so I'm afraid I, I can't offer, offer anything there. Does the MCSC collect from uh, digital services as well as from karaoke? And I thought they also collected from broadcast services, uh, radio and television, which I sort of thought was a bit of a contradiction since they're a government body and most of the broadcast media is government-owned. It seems like they were collecting from themselves to pay themselves. And it wasn't clear whether or not they were collecting from, let's say, Top 100 or from, um, you know, Baidu's from Ting, for example, for ad-supported streaming services, or for downloads, for that are. matter. I believe they are, but um, I, I don't have, I can't say for certain, I believe they are. Okay. Thank you. Maybe maybe I could uh, at some point email you and uh, get some clarification on that, so... And our next question comes from Robert Singerman. Sir, your line is open. Thanks. Uh, <clears throat> I was going to ask a question on publishing as well, but uh, um, Tim, uh, in the publishing side, I've heard also that uh, publishers generally the percentage is six to eight percent, and I've also heard that MCSC really isn't paying international publishers; that they're saying they don't have a mandate to actually pay the international publishers. So, um, and and I know that they're not collecting now from China Mobile, for example. But uh, is the six to eight percent uh, consistent with what you're um, you're seeing there? I'm afraid I have to say I don't have personal experience of dealing with MCSC. Um, I'm not advising companies on, on issues around publishing currently, so um, we can certainly look into it. But I'm afraid I, I don't have an answer for you today. I have another question: that the, the uh, sixty-seven or sixty-four million dollars is that non-Asian uh, music, is that non-Canto pop, non-Chinese music, or is that total music sales in China? Um, that is, I mean, figures, completely accurate figures are quite difficult to come by in China. Uh, those are figures uh, pr pulled together um, by IFPI, and as I understand the, the methodology that IFPI uses, is it takes... Uh, its own members' repertoire, which includes a lot of that um, Korean, Taiwanese, Hong Kong repertoire, it, it obviously can get data from its own members as to the income that they are receiving from China. It then makes an assessment of the proportion of the whole market that those IFPI members enjoy, and then it uh, uh, and then it works backwards, as it were, to, under to, to, to estimate what the total market is. So yes, yeah, my understanding is that that is a it is, is a total market figure, but based on on limited data that's available and then extrapolated. Oh, that's low market. One last question: uh, the app market. China is said to be the second biggest app market to the U.S. now. Uh, mobile apps. Uh, in in your opinion, uh, would all the music that might be found on mobile apps need to be? Um, cleared through the MOC or the GAPP, probably the MOC process. It's my understanding that that's probably yes, but I just wanted to get your opinion on that. Yeah, my, my assumption would be the same. My assumption would be the same. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, yeah. And our next question comes from Charles Book. So your line is open. Hi, guys. Uh, I was actually going to ask very similar questions in regard to publishing. Um, I guess, I guess it's all been answered, but one thing that I heard rumors of at Medium was uh, potentially a new collections organization being formed, you know, in regards to mechanicals. And cause I know that's kind of a big question when it comes down to finding digital partners, and especially because without without something being in place, I mean, I know some folks put, you know, money in escrow thinking that this is going to happen down the line. So I just wanted to get your thoughts on that and if you heard about any new rights organizations coming coming to for this year. Um I, personally, I'm not aware of any of any coming to the fore. Um, so, uh, obviously, again, I'm, I'm happy to to look into that, but uh, I don't have an answer for you right now. Okay, thank you. And I'm not showing. Excuse me, I just had another question queue up. Robert Singerman, your line is open. Thanks. Uh, I just wanted to mention uh, to Charles's question. What I've heard uh, as well from my colleagues in China is that the MOC is actually going to give a second number. Uh, currently, they give a number which is really reflecting of the master um, approval, the approval of the master once they uh, approve the track, uh, you know, for the censorship 
area of it, and it's also an anti-piracy. But they're supposed to be uh, going to give a second number, which is actually the approval for the song itself on the publishing side. Is that something that you've heard, Tim? Maybe that's what Charles is referring to. I'm not sure. Um, that, that could be what Charles is, is referring to. It sounds consistent, but I say I'm afraid I, I, I don't have a firm answer on that. All right, thanks. Yeah, I, I, I heard Robert. This, I talked to the people from Kava. This is Rich again. We, we have a relationship with the people from Kava and some related companies up in Shanghai when we were at Meet Them. And they seem to indicate that's one of the barriers. That's why people keep bringing this up, Tim, to get rights to bring it into the marketplace. The people who have the publishing side, uh, want to make sure at some point that they get paid. And, uh, and this is something that's been going on for a while. I was at a conference in Shanghai, I guess it was about two years ago, where, uh, we met with government officials, and they seem receptive to that. But we'll see how it plays out during the year. I'm not showing any further questions at this time. Well, if that's the case, on behalf of everyone from A2IM, I'd like to thank everyone who was on this call. I, I Really appreciate especially Andrea and Dawn who did all the legwork and we sort of just drafted behind them. We heard some wonderful presentations from Raquel, Tim, and John tonight. We thank all three of you so much, especially John and Tim, as, as this was early in the morning for you and uh, you did this on a uh, pro bono basis, although we appreciate everything that uh, – Everyone from Commerce ITA has done for us as well. So we just couldn't thank you enough. This is the first one, as I said. Exports is becoming a big priority as the U.S. Mar our own marketplace has shrunk over the last five years. And uh, we're really going to be attacking the market. And hopefully, both John and Tim, both of your cities, will be visiting you later this year. And we'll be able to invite you to a reception and get to meet you face-to-face. -face. So, uh, you know, that would be great. Thank but this, you very this, much. Was, this was just terrific uh and i'll throw it back to andrea to close all right i think you said it well rich uh, i really appreciate uh, especially with these uh tough time differences between the east coast and hold on hold on we, we have leah in mountain apple in hawaii so for her it's, it's just a little bit after lunchtime you're making a presumption about the size of our country uh but but uh yeah, we're spread out across the country as well. I'm just teasing. Okay. But we do have someone on the call from Hawaii today, one of our members, not in Apple. That's great. Welcome. Well, what we'll try to do is uh, is get um, more clarity and answers to some of the questions that uh, we we weren't the right people to respond to, essentially. And uh, uh, I'm actually thinking out loud here, these could be some good topics for future webinars. Uh, and um, especially to all the speakers, thank you very much. I think we've all uh, learned a lot. And um, I just uh, wish you a, a good rest of the day or evening, and I look forward to working with everyone in the near future. And thanks to Don for helping with so much of the logistics as well. Thank you all. Thanks, everyone. Have a great thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Bye-bye. Oh.